blogtalkradio.com. Consciousness in action. And you are taking action into your consciousness by tuning into Contact Talk Radio. And on tunein.com, ping.fm, and upsnap mobile. Contact Talk Radio. inspiration brave action and heartwarming journeys this is what the louise h reed show brings you now here's your host louise h reed hello 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 everybody hello and thank you for joining me this wonderful tuesday i'm your host louise h reed with listeners in over 145 countries and with millions of itunes downloads each month i am the fortunate host with you uh, each, each week at this time to explore the incredible journeys of amazing people who are real examples of taking brave, bold action in pursuit of their dreams and goals. And in the and while doing so, leaving positive prints all over the world through these actions. I'd like to remind everyone listening that information about my guests and the show can be found on my website, louisehreed.com. So today's guest is an extra special one to me. I haven't told Tracy that, (laughs) but it is an extra special week, a month, and Tracy, uh, through unbeknownst to us, uh, we are connected in a way that we're not happy necessarily to be connected with, but it is a special kind of bond. What am I talking about? I'm talking about the fact that in Canada this week and in the U.S. in the U.S. next week, it is Mental Illness Awareness Week. In addition, it's also Bullying Prevention Month, ADHD Month, and I perhaps may be missing some. And so Tracy uh, is, is joining us today on a really, a really important week and, and talking about a really important topic. And in honor of Mental Illness Awareness Month and with the or Mental Illness Awareness Week um, and the fact that depression has, has struck me, I myself, I've not divulged this over the, the radio waves, but I'm not shy or embarrassed to share that I have struggled with mental health, mental illness, and an eating disorder since I was in my mid-teens. And so as such, this topic is so important to me to share with others, and I feel very honored and thankful to be able to have Tracy Maxfield as my special guest today. So before I tell you, or we have this conversation with Tracy, I'd like to tell you a little bit about her. So Tracy Maxfield is a nurse with over 35 years experience in the healthcare field. She herself experienced her first episode of clinical depression in her 20s and lived with chronic depression ever since. However, nothing prepared her for the acute depressive episode she experienced in 2015. After enduring years of intense workplace stress, harassment and bullying, Tracy plummeted into an abyss of darkness, hopelessness and despair the likes of which she had never experienced before. Encouraged by a psychologist, Tracy did start a blog called Escaping the Rabbit Hole, My Life with Depression to better help her friends understand her depression. Over time, Tracy began to heal and found that out of the darkness and despair, there is hope, there is life after depression. She has since done many wonderful things, including she has written a book, which I have in my hands here. Those watching live on Facebook can see. Listeners, it's called Escaping the Rabbit Hole. And since the release of this book, Tracy has become a staunch advocate for mental illness and mental health awareness and bullying. And she has met with teenagers ages 12 to 15 years to talk about bullying and mental illness. So you have heard enough from me. I would love Tracy to welcome you to the show today. Thank you. I'm a little overwhelmed there. (laughs) It's kind of hard to hear all those things, isn't it? It it certainly is. Yes. Um, But I'm, I'm very honored to be on your show. Well, thank you. Um, There's so many things for us to explore over this time, but the thing I'm most curious about off the top is that, sadly, uh, we know the statistics, many people struggle with depression and mental illness. Most don't write a book. 
So before we hear more about your journey, what compelled you to share your story when so many of us stay silent? I, it was really two reasons. Um, the first, as I explained, the depression that I experienced when I quote unquote fell down the rabbit hole was like nothing um, I was prepared for. I had experienced previous depressive episodes and they'd usually resolved within six months to a year. But this time it was so bad that I couldn't even make sense out of what was happening. Um, not only was it the, the intense pain and sorrow and stress and hopelessness, but it was such strong suicide ideation that I was actually following through and making plans, something that I had never done in the past, but also it was the physical. And the morning after, um, so I fell down the rabbit hole on a Thursday when I woke up, the Friday morning, I couldn't get out of bed. Um, I felt like during the night I'd been encased in cement and it was so heavy that in order to get upstairs to the kitchen, I was literally crawling. Wow. And I started to think maybe there were other health issues happening to me. And as much uh, research that I had done into depression, they never really go into the, the physical effects that you can also experience. And so I think that really prompted me because I remember when I finally realized that the cement mm -hmm. feet, the cement boots, the cement shoulder pads were part and parcel of an acute depressive episode and the confusion and the inability to problem solve and the, the like walking down an airplane, uh, you know you're present, but you're not present. Yeah. And the doctor and psychologist started to explain that this was actually part of the process. Antidepressants, dry mouth. <laughs> so, and it, I understand. It was, yeah. <laughs> and I thought, oh my goodness, I'm a nurse. I know about depression. I know about these things. I'm trying to do everything possible to try and make sense of what was happening to me. And I'm thinking, how can other people go through this? How can they deal with this? I was also on my own. Um, I was divorced, I had moved out, I was living on my own. And so literally I could not get to a doctor. I had to do it myself. Right, had so, so what was the first, I'm curious to know what the first thing you did. So when you woke up that morning, feeling as though you were encased in cement, what, what did you do? What was the first, what was the first thing that you did and when did, and how much time passed until you got help? Um, so when I finally struggled to get out of bed, um, I crawled upstairs and I took my medication because I had been on antidepressants long term. Right. Um, but it was, I think that I spent the day in, in a haze. It was, I likened it immediately to falling down the rabbit hole. I felt trapped. It was darkness. I, I kept telling myself what I should do, but I, that day, I think I just spent curled up in a ball in bed and then would get up at intervals to go to the washroom or to go and take my meds to force myself to have something to eat. Um, it was on the Monday that I actually sought help after there was the suicide plan on the, on the Saturday. And that's when I realized I had come so close to actually ending my life that the medication I was on was not working, obviously, and I really needed to go and see my doctor and talk to her about what was happening. So tell me a little bit about the, the name of your, your book, and I want to then start exploring some of your journey because there's so many layers to unpack, which you've already sort of talked high level about some of those layers. Where did the title of your book come from? Or was it what you just said a moment yes, ago? About, that's honest. That's felt literally. Like I, I literally felt like I had fallen 
down a rabbit hole. Um, where I was, it was dark, it was oppressive, it was suffocating. I felt like I was be everything was closing in on me, but it wasn't warmth, it, it felt damp and it felt unwelcome. And it, I guess it felt like I was in hell, for want of yeah. a better word. And even though I was aware that there was the tiniest light, and I mean like the tiniest glimmer of light, it was, I felt so suffocated and so overwhelmed that I couldn't even figure out how I was, how I was going to get out. Um, it was, it just felt like I had plummeted headfirst down into this abyss. And it was just me and my quilt and a pillow. Yeah. And the, and the space was so, I mean, it was a rabbit hole. I, I evolved in a very small space. Um, it wasn't a vast space. It was a very small circle that seemed to be constricting me and just taking me every day. It was getting tighter and tighter and tighter that I, I felt I was losing myself. Yeah, it's interesting, isn't it? Because I know I mentioned to you when we spoke recently that I saw myself inside a, an old well, a dried out well. And I was in the bottom of the well. So it's interesting how some of these descriptions are, are, are quite similar. So we, and I'm saying this because listeners, um, I think we, we often feel alone. And oh, if definitely. There's, if there's someone listening who is experiencing some of these things, while it, of course, is uniquely happening to you, your symptoms are not actually unique. No, it isn't no. you. It is something that is happening to you that there, is, there, is a, there are people who, who can support and can help. Um, I remember the night when I was in, in, in the bottom of my well, I would look up and I could see the light. So you mentioned the light as well. And, and thankfully, I could still see that light of, of, of hope. So I knew there was a way out, but there was no, I described that there was no ladder. I was jumping and screaming yeah. and no one could hear me. Yeah. Um, but a ladder did eventually get built and I was able, able to climb out of that well. Um, let's talk a little bit about that, a little bit about the process, because the process for some is, is in terms of getting out of the rabbit hole. The process for some, uh, or the process is different, isn't it? Yes, it's different definitely. for different people. Mm -hmm. And that's actually part, I think, of the challenge in understanding depression as well. Is it, It's not like you get strep throat, you go to the doctor, you get the same medication as your neighbor got who has strep throat too, and then you know, you're on your way, Bob's your uncle, you, you know, you resolve the, the strep throat. The, the treatment plans look very different for different uh, individuals. So let's walk a little bit through how, how that, you know, how, how that worked for you. Because, you know, in reading your book, Escaping the Rabbit Hole, my journey through depression, I was interested in how, you know, you took, walked through that. Um, specifically, your first visit with what you call DBS. Death by suicide. Death by suicide. Tell us a little bit about, because that's part of, that was part of this process of getting out, that yeah. death by suicide became a sidekick. Oh, he was with me all the time. He still is. Just sometimes I describe him now uh, as, um, most days his voice is a whisper, but some days it can be an almighty roar. Wow. Um, I think, and I mean, you know as well, when you live with depression, um, it's every, most people um, who have experienced depression have felt such overwhelming hopelessness and that, quote unquote, the world would be better off without them. And so whilst they may not have even planned a suicide, it has popped into their head in some shape or form. Um, with, with me, it came so suddenly. I, mean, I, was, I couldn't think straight on the Thursday, Friday. And so to be perfectly honest, ending my life didn't crop up. But on the Saturday, um, as I'm trying to understand what is going on with me and what is happening, um, he just, there was, it just came. There he was, there he was. Yeah. And, and it was, actually, it made sense. It, it kind of gave you that inner calm. And I think it was that, because depression is t losing control of your life. You're losing everything that I had on the Thursday morning was lost on the Thursday evening. Everything, mm -hmm. everything that I had known. 
Um, and so the depression, the, the suicide component, excuse me again, um, scared me because I literally counted the pills out. Yeah. On the counter and as a nurse, I know how many. Yeah. So what, what made you what made you stop? Or do you not even know? I I was play I was playing with them and I was making lovely shapes because there were so many of them. And I had the water ready and there was no voice, it was just an instinctive run. And it was literally act now or else. And so I just ran down, grabbed my purse, threw my flip-flops on, and I said in the book, like, I looked a total mess because I had been, I mean, crying and crying and everything all day. And I just went to Walmart because it was the only thing open on a Saturday night. Mm -hmm. um, and it was just, it, it was common sense intervened at the last minute. And that voice said, if you don't do something right now, this is it for you. Right. And it, it was merely a second, two seconds. And I think we all have that voice. And it's those people that hear the voice and say, I'm doing it. Um, and, and at that point, I was very, very scared. When I got home, I discarded the pills. And I was like, okay, you've got to go see your doctor. I can't, I can't keep, it's bad enough feeling with the depression, but then when you're trying to battle with your life, it's like, okay, no, I can't do this. And it's, yes, I mean, the book is really to help everyone know that what they're going through is, is normal. Quote, yes. unquote, it is part of the process. Some will experience things differently but you were not alone I thought I was I thought I was completely alone I battled it myself and it was one war that I don't want to ever fight again um, but I at the end of it I thought I, I don't want anyone else to go through what I'm going through I want them to know that okay this is you and I did it on my own. I had no support system, albeit friends, but again, friends have their own lives. Yes. And I had a doctor and a psychologist, but they're also not available 24 seven. And there's the stubborn British in me as well. Like, come on. <laughs> I don't know what you're talking about. <laughs> this lip, girl, come on, you can do this. You're a nurse. Come on, what's going on here? And so I did not want anyone to ever feel like they were on their own and that they could not get through it. Because to be perfectly honest, Louise, even today, when I look back, I'm amazed that I'm here. Yeah, I think that's such a really noble thing that you did not want anyone to feel alone. No. And that's a noble reason and really um, quite a touching one that inspired you or was part of the inspiration behind sharing your story as a blog and then making making a book. There was something um, that you that you wrote that I highlighted in your book that I thought was interesting. And as, as a side note, I also believe that this would likely be a really interesting read for those who have a loved one or friend with depression who has never and they themselves have not experienced depression to try and get a little bit more insight. Um, for, for a couple of reasons. One is because of just the way that you described the journey and the feelings and the physical symptoms. But another because there's some really good resources um, towards, towards the end of the book mm -hmm. in terms of your self-help plan. And I want to explore that a little bit shortly, but your self-help plan um, and other mental health resources. So those listening right now who may wish, who they themselves may be struggling or who have a loved one or friend who may be struggling, this could be a really, really excellent resource. Anyway, going back to what I was it's on page 34, it says, when you are in the rabbit hole, everything changes. Mm -hmm. The person mm -hmm. you once were disappears. Mm -hmm. The life you once had is gone and you have to start all over again. Your life revolves around time and tasks. And I wanted to take the conversation there about time and tasks because I know you are quite regimented in your, um, your daily routine. 
Mm -hmm. So talk to me about what that looks like and how that has been a help through this process and through this journey out of the rabbit hole. So at the beginning, it's so dark and overwhelming that you literally go in minute by minute because you can't plan. And to be perfectly honest, you can't even see ahead to the afternoon or the evening. It's like you're stuck in time. And talking with my physician, uh, it was then you just go minute by minute, Tracy. And then maybe in a couple of days, you'll feel you can go five minutes or maybe 15 minutes. And so with the help of the antidepressant that I'm on right now, Zimbalta, um, it helped perk up my dopamine, which had plummeted. And the dopamine enabled me to start, it, they call it moving towards goals. So, th- so it just gives you that little bit of not oomph, but just that little motivation spark that you think, okay, um, I'm going to try this. I'm going to try and do this. And so the nurse common sense part of me is saying, okay, well, you've got to eat. So you've got to have your three meals a day <laughs> and you've got to try and eat healthy, right? And you should exercise because we know that as bad as you feel, exercise releases endorphins and that can also help give you that little boost. And it was everything I could think of which would keep me busy and provide a distraction because if you have no distractions or tasks, the brain starts working. And with depression, we are our own worst enemy. And I call them them the ants, the automatic negative thoughts, the ants in the brain start going, you're hopeless, you're stupid, no one loves you, you're, you know, you're pathetic. And it just escalates and escalates and it overwhelms you to such a degree that then that leads to the visit from DBS. And so it was what, you know, I've got to do something. I, I am not working. I am off sick. I have got to try and get healthy. And for me, it was, okay, come on, three weeks, six months, you're going to do this. You're going to get over this girl. (laughs) And it was, okay, so let's see, let's start a routine. So it was, okay, get up. So getting up between seven and eight, make, okay, have breakfast, take your pills. Okay, what are you going to do? Okay, let's watch the morning news. Okay. And then it's like, okay, let's get out and do some exercise. And so it's also, I think it's not wasting time, but it's something to try and help pass time because even though I wasn't sleeping great, the opportunity to go to bed and maybe sleep for a short period of time was that relief from dealing with just the the turmoil and the intense anguish of each day yes Um, because you can't you know you can't snap out of it you feel you you really can't and so it was the you know I'd come home from my my bike ride and then I would take a shower and have my lunch and it was still summer going into fall and so in the Okanagan the weather was beautiful and so it was what could I do and so, color and so I started to color I bought a coloring book yeah I have some of those I've got a Harry Potter one <laughs> and I colored and I colored and I colored and it was just something to do to concentrate on making sure you stayed at between the lines and right. Take your mind off where it otherwise would go. Yeah, yeah. And so it just was just, you know, what could I do to avoid thinking of any negative thoughts? And they're inevitably going to crop up in your mind. And so it was, okay, get back to coloring. And it was... Get back to the task. It was so weird because I then had, I formed such a structured day with this routine, if I actually deviated from it, I would get into panic mode because, (laughs) you know, okay. I mean, in the winter, 
I realized I had to go and socialize with people. So I would actually go to Starbucks. Yeah. And I would sit there for hours and hours. And in fact, in acknowledgments, there's a paragraph dedicated to the baristas mm -hmm. because they got to know me so well. And I would do the National Post crossword puzzle. And it would take me hours, hours, because this, this whole thing, this brain, it doesn't work. But well, it, I have to say, I have to just interject here and say, if you're, even if you're in the depressed state brain, can finish one of those crosswords, you're better than me and my best of days. So well, ha ha hats off to you. <laughs> and again, most of the time I didn't finish it. Okay. Yeah. Right. It was or, a task that would just, you could yes. get, they focused yeah. on that instead of where else it would go. Yeah. It, you know, and it was just, it just enabled me to move forward because what my psychologist kept saying was, your brain has undergone such a traumatic experience that it's going to take a very long time to heal. And so you got to give yourself permission to go through the process. And so, okay, keep to your routine. And then maybe if you feel strong enough or better, you can then change something in your routine. And so I think it's very important. And lots of people I've spoken to who have been living with depression said, knowing that there were tasks to do, even though it would take them a much longer time frame, just give them enough strength to, okay, let's get to another day. I made it. Okay, maybe yeah. I can make it another week. And it's kind of that bargaining chip, you know? Yeah. It's interesting, um, so many things that you're saying re resonate, it shouldn't be that interesting. Uh, I shouldn't be surprised that so much of what you're saying resonates with me, but no doubt it'll be resonating with some of our listeners as well. Um, one of the things that you say in your book, and you, you, you alluded to this just a moment ago when you're talking about giving yourself permission, uh, is you said uh, that you had sort of a mantra of sorts. I'm trying to be okay with not being okay, being all, okay time. all the time. And that's that that permission. So I imagine, you know, you wake up in the morning and if you're not feeling okay that day, what would happen? If you didn't, if you, before, before you came up with that idea of permitting yourself to not be okay, I'm sure oh. you'd wake up that morning and probably beat yourself up and actually continue to make the thing, the situation worse. Absolutely worse. And then what would happen is I would just fall apart and start the suicide plan. So, um, those, so, those, so someone listening right now who might be, who perhaps has never spoken to anyone about how they are doing, that they are actually not okay and they have never told anyone that they're not okay, but they're listening to us right now and see and hear themselves. You have shared a lot of strategies or even over the last you know, 30 minutes, what is the first thing that you would suggest that they do? They've got to get help. So reach out. They absolutely have to reach out. And they obviously, if they're going through something really, really bad and scary right now, they have to reach out. It could be to anybody, but they need to see a doctor. Okay. I cannot stress that enough. And I know a lot of people are vehemently opposed to the idea of medications. I, I, am, not a, I am not a pill pusher. Yeah. Um, <laughs> and I mean, I strongly believe that there are very certain types of depression where you do need to have an, a medication to help you get over that traumatic hurdle. It, in, it's not going to clear everything up. It's not, you know, I am healed, hallelujah. It really isn't. It just enables you to come to a place where maybe you can start formulating a daily routine, setting up appointments and trying to make sense of, okay, now, I'm not cured, but I know I need to have counseling or 
I need to do this. And it just, it, it kind of shines a torch in the darkness for you. Let's go this way. Right. You don't know what the, you don't know what is at the end of this way, but it just helps you because I know for a fact, if I had not changed the antidepressant, I would not be here. Yeah. Without That's a shadow powerful. of a doubt. That's I, powerful. And so those listening who may have friends or family members who are struggling, it is, it, it's just so vital that we may, that we perhaps even reach out to them. Absolutely. You know, ask, um, so the, when I was in my darkest place, when I was in the bottom of the well, and I know I mentioned this to you as well already, Tracy, is that when I took the medication and I actually, I, to be honest, I'm kind of anti-medication. So this is, but I had to go in with an open mind when I saw my doctor, because clearly whatever I was doing on my own wasn't working. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I've got a, a background in wellness and lifestyle management, among other things, as well as coaching. Um, but I'm very much a, fa a fan and, and, a, and a, a fan and um, an advocate for alternative modalities of healing. That is all to say, I chose to take medication, and that was the ladder. The ladder then, my mm -hmm. medication was the ladder that came right. that helped me get out of the well. I thought there is the path. Yes. Not all of the rungs were in the ladder, but That's there right. was the path, and I knew now that I could do it. And so that, to what you were saying, you know, that allowed me then to set up my routine, be very task oriented. Each rung was like a task. Yes. And so there is a way out. Those listening who may be struggling, there is a way out and lean on, on others who have gone, who have who've, who've experienced it uh, as well. Why is there such a stigma? Why does the stigma still exist? Uh, I think it's because so many people do not understand depression. Um, for men, it's a huge stigma because of the, the stereotypical male role of the provider the hero, the tough guy, and what do you mean you're feeling sad and, you know, snap out of it. And again, people think depression is sadness. It's not sadness. It is so much, it is so much more. Um, we, all we all have periods of feeling sad. We all have periods of feeling down. But depression kind of takes it one step further in that you're stuck. And so I think the stigma is, I mean, we can go back to Victorian times where, and this is not to do the, the male-female thing, but even then, back in Victorian times, um, you know, the women were regarded as histrionic. And yeah. so, or... Um, if someone had a depression, they were usually put in the insane asylum because no one was really making sense of what was going on. And that started lots of the lobotomies and, you know, let's see if we can do something if we drill into the head. And it was the, it's the lack of understanding. And also the media doesn't help because, you know, when you have people that flop down on a sofa and say, oh, I've been so depressed, you know, um, I went that's not, what, get... that's not what people say. <laughs> that's but, but, what... But, but that's the thing. On, the, yeah. on social media right. and on TV, sometimes that's they... That's how it's portrayed. That's how it's portrayed. And then the next thing, something happens, like they meet their knight in shining armor and their life turns around. And you're like, no, that isn't, that isn't depression. Uh, and I think also it's because antidepressants um, are seen to be the, the cure and the happy pill. And it's, well, you know, you shouldn't be depressed because if you take your happy pill, everything's going to be fine. And it's like, actually, no, it, it just helps you, as you said, find the next rung on the ladder or shine the light down the path that you could start taking action to get out of here. The stigma is, and I don't know, it's going to take an awful lot of time and education to for people to start recognizing that 
there are so many people in the world that have depression. Yes. Um, every single person that you could bump into today and ask if they hadn't if they haven't gone through it themselves, they know someone who has, whether or not it's in the workplace or a family friend. It's the stigma because it's the head and the head is related to insanity and craziness. And also the stigma of the depression is just laziness and you're dwelling on things. And if you think positive, happy thoughts, um, you'll be fine. And people think that <laughs> depression is a, an inward self-centered, um, self-imposed sadness that you do to get attention. And it's like, are you kidding me? If, if you uh, I, I have a friend, I've got a friend, uh, it's a friend of a friend whose um, teenage daughter is actually in the hospital right now with an eating disorder and her very well-intentioned and loving and wonderful mum. I'm not a parent blamer. I'm just sort of giving some insight into no, how, what you're saying in terms of lack of education and perpetuating the stigma. Um, she thinks her daughter is doing it for attention. Yes. Yeah, <laughs> and she's actually hospitalized. So uh, it, to your point, um, we, that, I guess that's why you're doing, that's why you've created and written this book, why you have shared your voice and shared your experience and why you now are on this radio show. I know you're a regular on an, 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 another individual's radio show whose name escapes me. Peter, you Peter, shout out Peter Rosenberger in Nashville. Peter Rosenberger, shout out to you. Um, and you're doing your part in trying to, um, to, to, to educate others. And I know you're spending a lot of time now on youth, but before we do get to the youth component, I wanted to, to <laughs> have a, it's, it's, I'm chuckling of, over some of the things that you, you wrote in your book, the 10 strangest things oh, people, people have said, said to me. I would like to insert a word here and say, the 10 strangest things dumbass people have said to me. I shouldn't say, you know what, they're uneducated, they're not, not aware. Well, no, actually, in honesty, Louise, some of them are dumbasses. <laughs> <laughs> let's, okay, be, so, let's be honest there are some in the world <laughs> I mean seriously we were talking just before we started today if you can't laugh a little bit at something along the way uh, we're, we're, we're in some serious trouble if we're not already okay so listeners do any of these apply to you we're not going to judge you on this just don't say <laughs> these dumbass things again okay so oh you have depression really are you sure because you don't look depressed number two you mean you haven't been able to work for over a year because of depression? No, that can't be right. You should be over it by now. You must have something else. <laughs> Number three, do you go to church? No? Well, if you embrace the Lord, you will feel much better. Number four, there's no such thing as depression. It's all in yeah. the mind. <laughs> yeah, depression is in the mind. Yeah, I know. <laughs> Duh. Okay. Number five, depression, should you be out? People who have depression are too sick to go anywhere. You must have the light version. Did you really hear that? The light yeah. version? The light version. <laughs> like there's a light version. Okay. <laughs> Number six, you can't have depression. You look too good. You are obviously high functioning. Yeah. We're not talking about autism, folks. <laughs> uh, Number seven, depression is a choice. You can choose to be depressed or not. I've never been, a, I've never been depressed a day in my life because I choose not to be. Good how, you, damaging, hey? how damaging it's no wonder people feel alone well and it's I mean when people used to say this to me um I thought oh my goodness um I got to the stage where it was like okay just let it be just walk away and let it be um because I didn't want to get over emotional because then you're so yeah. hyper emotional, yeah. but I but I would laugh to myself and think, oh my goodness, if I didn't have control over my actions right now, I would just run into traffic after yeah. they said that to me. Yeah. And I know lots of them truly did not understand. And I said that was another reason for the book was it's it was three reasons for people with depression never ever to feel that they're alone and there's hope. Second reason for anyone caring for people with depression to understand that they're not lazy lying in bed all day. 
<laughs> the, the, and what they need to do to help them get out of bed because you can't stay in bed. And number three was to educate others and especially health professionals because I had many doctors and nurses who read my blog being in the healthcare field and they would say to me, I, I didn't know that about depression. I had no idea. And so it evolved into kind of, it was very healing and cathartic for me, but it was my way of saying, okay, this is me, bare bones, everything. Like the book is raw. And I, am, raw. I am truly yeah. exposing my everything, my inner self. And I needed to do that for people who even knew me and saw me. And as a Brit, you know, Louise, um, when you leave the house <laughs> as a Brit, it is indoctrinated from the moment you are born that you have to try and look your best. Mm -hmm. And so you would go out and you would have showered and combed your hair and put on clean clothes. Yeah. And yet everyone then says, well, and you look too good. And it's yeah. like, no, crawl into my brain for a moment. And I, for lots of people that have, that do know me, it, the book was an eye-opening experience because some of the dates that I mention in the book, they were there that day and they said, oh my goodness, you mean I was sitting next to you and all this was going on and I had no idea. Yeah. And I said, and that's what depression is. We say, I'm fine. How are you? I'm okay. Because well, we're also we're also like that kind of society, aren't we? Mm -hmm. um, before I started, before I experienced depression, I was um, I was I was I was young, much younger. So I'm guessing I was around maybe ten or twelve. I I went to church one day with my family, um, and I remember someone asking me, um, you know, afterwards and when we're having coffee and cookies or whatever. Oh, you know, how are you, Louise? And I started to tell them how I really was, and again, not mum blaming here. My mum's amazing if you're listening mom plug your ears I remember my mom saying Louise you don't say that you just say I'm fine yes. I said well what if I'm not fine she said well they don't want to hear all of that and I said well <laughs> they're going to learn really quickly that if they don't want to know they're not going to ask me um but to your point you know there's a picture in your book that was was interesting and I liked that the images that you had they're very very powerful there's an image in one of your books sorry one image in your book I'll just show you because this one here Oh, yes. The I'm um, fine. Mm -hmm. For those listening, there's a, you know, the silhouette of an individual and on, the, on their face is the word fine. But then all around this, this woman are the words alone, hurt, down, sad, bullied, nostalgic, lonely, you know, all of these words which really are, um, are being felt. What was interesting for me is that the, those labels actually sort of even helped. Because I think sometimes we struggle to even you say fine and you're so not fine, but what actually are you? Um, I realized that wasn't the purpose for it. The purpose is to show others that we say fine and yet we're all these other things. Yes, yes. But apparently on the list here of dumbass things people say, number nine is that, um, you know, God will only give you what you can handle as a test. Yes. Mm -hmm. yes. Speaking yes. on the line of church, going to church. Um, did you know how many people in the world are worse off than you? Yes. There are children starving, people dying, really, depression? Just yes. get over it. Yes. And then finally, you indicated oh, oh. number 10 is your personal favorite. Oh, my personal favorite, yes. Do you, remember, you, do you remember off the top of your head what it is? Yes. So I read this. You can read it, but it's okay. the Yeah. I didn't want to steal your thunder. Yes, so thank you. Here we go. <laughs> number 10. Oh, no. That's not good. Satan is inside you. You invited Satan into your life. That's what depression is. If I had a mic to drop, I would drop a mic right now. Um, yeah. Yes. So this is why it's so important that we have these conversations. This Absolutely. is why I so appreciate how vulnerable you have been in your book, in your blog, with me today, as well as you, as you are regularly through your social media channels um, and with, uh, with Peter and that other podcast that you're, or radio show that you're regularly on. Um, so I can't express my, my personal gratitude, uh, gratitude enough. Um, so I would like to turn my attention now or our attention and conversation to something that I found interesting. I've, 
I know that you work now, um, or you've got a specific interest in youth. And I was thinking about it last night, actually. And I was like, this is an interesting perspective. When I was young and recycling just got started, they started, the focus was on educating children in school because then they would be going home and sort of forcing, <laughs> twisting their parents' arms into, mom, dad, we have to recycle. Don't you know this? Don't you know this? Don't you know this? This? And so I, I feel like, and you can you know, correct me if I'm wrong, but I feel like this is kind of the approach that you're sort of looking at. If we want to change our future, we start with our youth. We have to. Tell us a little bit about you know, your thoughts on this and how you're getting involved in the difference that you're trying to make. So initially, um, I became involved after I, I was invited to a middle school, after I released my book to talk to, um, I think they were 15 years old, uh, teenagers. Some of them had been going through some depression and anxiety the teacher had mentioned and so wanted me to come and talk about my book and the depression and what strategies I found helpful. And it was a very, very enlightening hour because um, there were quite a few kids there that not only were um, living with anxiety and or depression, but there was one that had just been discharged from hospital after a suicide attempt, her third. Wow. And everyone that was sitting there, if they didn't know of someone, be it a friend or a family member, they would raise their hand and actually admit, I think I have depression a lot of what you said, I'm going through. And so the teacher was very, very surprised at how open they were. I also, um, the illustrations in the book, many of them I had enlarged for the book release party. And so they're blown up and I took them with me and they were lined up on the blackboard behind and I could hear them talking to one another, pointing out, that's me. Uh, there's a picture, the one in the book where the, the figures got the hands up in the end. There's a huge black cloud following them. Um, yeah. And the one where they're dragging weights and they fall over of, of anxiety and depression. And they could really identify with the visual components. And so I was then invited to come back uh, two weeks later to their human library, where basically you sit at a table and they prearranged times to come and meet with you. And I was actually asked to come as an author of a book to, for them to understand how they could write a book, how to publish <laughs> it. And so they, the first group came in and sat down at my table and I started talking about publishing. And they're, they're like, no, no, tell us about how you made it. And I'm like, what do you mean? Well, depression. And I said, oh, I, I said, okay, so first of all, um, why did you sign up? And they said, you, you went and talked to the English class two weeks ago and everyone says that you, we've got to come and listen to you. I was like, okay. <laughs> and that's how it began. It was 30 minute sessions all day. And every sing and lots of it was starting to repeat myself, but then I would engage the kids because they they have really very articulate, intelligent questions. And so many of them volunteered so much information freely with uh, the group. And I I was absolutely shocked and heartbroken at how many of them were struggling very, very badly and had been for a long time. And so at the end of the day, um, I had met 65 teenagers and every single one of them either was being bullied or was living with a mental illness. And I, I cried all the way home. I'm thinking, as an adult, what I went through down the rabbit hole how are our kids supposed to go through this? And, and know that there is hope because 
they haven't got the life experiences and the life skills. And so they, for them struggling to fight this is going to be hard enough. But when I started doing research and it was one in five um, have a mental illness uh, before the age of 24, 75% yeah. of all, you know, will have a mental illness. And I thought, okay, so we know that this is happening at a very young age and lots of them, I mean, teenage suicide, highest ever. And so I thought, okay, no, no, no. I have to turn my attention to, to this population. And I really have to start letting them know that I'm there to advocate and support them, but also educate because so many people still say, oh no, he's only eight, he can't be depressed. You know, oh so, he's- So where, where does, does a, there won't be someone listening as young as eight right now, but someone who is, who is in their youth, if they don't want to talk to their parents, what do they do? Where, how should, who should they reach out to? Where do they turn? A, tr- a friend, um, a teacher. A teacher, yeah. A, yes, a counselor, a, a, their coach, someone that they feel they have a trusting relationship with. It may be an uncle, it may be a family friend. Usually they, there is someone, it may even be a neighbor. But and they, so parents, what about parents who are listening right now who they may know now perhaps some things to explore with for their own family? So whatever's going on inside their own home, perhaps they have some tips or strategies or at least know they need to learn more. What can we do at a larger scale? What can I do? I've got a, I'm a parent of four boys. How can I go and make a difference? Who do I speak to about trying to influence schools? Because if we're going to really make a big difference, we need schools and systems and school boards to get on board. So what can I do as a parent beyond what I can do in my own home with my own kids? What can I do? And I, it is, it's going to the principal and it's going to the teachers and the school board. It's going to local politicians, um, city council. It's a community problem. This is people, it's not a parent problem. This is a community, it's not a parent problem. This is a community problem, Uh, not a community problem, but it's the community have to work together to support our kids through this. Yes, education in schools, as even in early childhood education, it needs to start early and educate them about good mental health, how to promote it. And, you know, because kids are dealing with so much more than we ever dealt with when we were growing up. But it is going to the high school principals and the school trustees and saying, okay, you know what? We have all these kids that we know in the schools are not doing well that have suicide, ideation, or even commit suicide. What can we do? In your PTA meetings, your parent-teacher meetings, this this should be brought up and said, okay, what can we do? Youth groups. So uh, on, on, on that note, I am myself going to, I wrote, just wrote down a note to myself and I am challenging others to take something away from this conversation. What I'm taking away is I'm going to go to my school board, my principal, and talk about how we integrate mental health into the health curriculum. And I am not, I I thank you for for all of what you have shared with us. I thank you for spurring that in me, despite the fact that I myself have been challenged with this. I've never been uh, felt the, I felt compelled to reach out beyond myself and beyond my friends and my small circle. So thank you so much for inspiring that in me, um, for for doing that through your time spent with me today, through the words that you wrote in your book and the images that you had in there. And for all that you do, I thank you so much for all of that and for your time today. Thank you. I am. Um, it was wonderful. It was truly an honor. Thank you. So we have, I, we need to wrap up. We've got one minute quickly. How can people reach you or go to your website or access your book? So the book is available on Amazon. Um, but if they just want to go to www.tracymaxfield.com, all about the book, 
There's lots of great articles on teenage mental illness. There's resources. There's even all the illustrations from the book are on the website. It's a one place shop and they can listen to an audio version of the book. They can even see the YouTube video. So fantastic. Fantastic. Tracy's website, alternatively mine, louisehreader.com, will give you access to Tracy's coordinates as well. So at this time, I would like to thank you, all of my loyal listeners and followers, and remind you again, I will be here next week at the same time, 11 a.m. Eastern Standard Time. A big shout out to my producer, Cameron, at Contact Talk Radio. And finally, I would like to encourage and challenge you all to never suffer in silence, reach out for help, or extend that help to others. Much love and appreciation and gratitude to all of you today. And between now and next week, I encourage you all to be brave, be bold, and be happy. And I look forward to seeing you again next week. Goodbye, my friends.